<laughs> one of these and didn't realize what it was, uh, Bill Herring. That car went to Blakely and then went to uh, Larry Martin. Larry Martin. Larry yeah. Martin did the restoration on that car. Right? Uh, it was done at the same time that this one was restored. By the same people? Or did yes. Oh, it was done by Dick Robinson Dick? and Jimmy Keegan. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't realize they'd been done the same time. Yeah, they were essentially done together. Oh. And that was. You know, I'm trying to think whether it was done after my Sebring car, but it was a learning, somewhat a learning process, but Dick had done so many airbox cars before, the, before that that uh, it wasn't a real challenge because these, these cars were very much a c complete. Uh, they both had later motors right. in them but to be expected based on the usage of Let's talk about the chicken coop story on this car. <laughs> I don't think we talked about that. It right. That's how this uh, car came out of existence. When Bruce uh, traded it in for the 58, it went to a probably a student at a college in Fairfield, Iowa. He had a brief period of time, and then it went to two owners in Chicago. So it's all some Chicago winters and shows the evidence of it under, underneath. But then it wound up probably just sitting in a barn. And uh, Mike Hunt, who was the real early 56, 57 researcher for NCRS and later, I think for vet views on his own, but just had to love for them and grew up with them and everything and had some. Uh, he found it in a barn south, uh, north central Illinois, and uh, he wrote an article for the Restorer magazine, and he called it the chicken coop. And it was a play on words, coop, meaning a series of cars, which just wasn't a coop, but uh, he just thought that sounded good. There, there was no chickens in there, but there was plenty of dirt dust and everything oh, yeah. and uh, this was around 76 77 so it was early on in the restoration hobby but did he know what it was when he got it no but I think as time went on he found it because I uh, I've got probably every note he has and I has a the guy was a neat guy uh, I uh, I got letters after letters between us and what have you and uh, he had a sense of humor that was unique. Uh, he'd have a, a picture that kind of applied to cars with every letter, and just a neat guy. And did just, a, if you like 56, 57 Corvettes, he did a lot. He's for, a man. Uh, he he was, did a lot for the hobby. And, uh, but anyway, uh, at that time, and uh, do you remember what, uh, your Sebring Bill came up with his car? He was driving through Miyaka City in Florida and saw a, a, a Corvette with strange looking things on it, i.e. the hood scoops and the mm -hmm. and bought it. He didn't know what about it. He didn't know anything about it. Now he brought it to NCRS to show people and nobody at that time, that was in 86, 87, 88, something like that. That recent? Yeah, and nobody would tell him anything about it. Now, Mike Hunt thought the car, wanted to buy it, but he never told him about it. Bill still was it, mixed about that. So finally, uh, the car that Bill has now, the, the 57 that Webster Brenner had, came up for sale because Webster had died. And he couldn't own both of them. So he sold the white car to Blakely for enough to cover buying the, the red picture the 57 from Webster Brenner's estate. A week later, I think, a week or a month later, he was at a car show talking to a guy in Sarasota. And the guy came over to see his 57 and started talking about cars he owned. And he said he owned a uh, 57 uh, SR1. And Bill's ears perked up. What do you mean? He said, yeah. He said it was, I bought it through Dome. Okay, I raced it up 
in the Wisconsin area, I think it was, for years and years and years, and then I sold it, and uh, I, I don't know if he sold it in Florida or ended up in Florida, and, and that car was the car he originally owned. Uh, and from there, and that pieces of information, that's where I think you got some information out about SR1s, and finally came to light what these cars were. And uh, he still regret selling that car before he found out what it was. But it was just like a lot of stuff in our ha our habit, it just happenstance. I was talking to this guy, and we talked about this, and this came up. And uh, that's how he found out what these cars were and how to find out the documentation on them, the fact that there were six of them. Apparently this guy used to run a 54 or 55, and they called him and said, hey, you, know, you might want to come down and look at one of these cars. We just got these in. Uh, and he drove up there and bought it on the spot, traded in these other cars, raced it up in the north, up Wisconsin area, or I think it's Wisconsin. There's a picture of that car in the third issue of Corvette News right. on a SECA road rally in, I believe, Wisconsin. Right. And, like and I, said, uh, at, I remember, I think I remember the first time Bill had that car in CRS me because he it was at the Winter Haven, Florida, the, the Cypress meet, and he had it parked next to the dumpster. <laughs> and people were looking at it, and just like this car, well, it's not a Sebring car because the serial number is too late. Sebring was in March. These cars were produced in early June. So it wasn't a Sebring car, but what is it? Right. Even when Frank bought it, it was, they called it, uh, had kind of a derogatory term for it, they called it the clone car. It took me about five years to convince them, this is not a clone car. And by that time we were getting more paperwork and I had contact with Bruce Geisler and so on. But I just, it took me a while to just get Dick Robson to stop calling it a clone <laughs> car, it's an SR1. It, probably, no one Chevrolet, that's probably what they referred to it as because it was a quote clone of the racing car but in essence it was the production car that the racing car contributed parts it could be but uh, any of their official documents i believe call it like an sr1 they do competition a, type uh, corvette it, it they gave it a long name and okay. it's on uh, one of the documents where it said we're going to produce these six cars and we're going to produce them with radials and heaters have all these racing options on it, but yet I'm trying to figure out whether they're building a race car or a production car, but they did have the substantial amount of race options. Well, Very substantial amount of race 11 options. 11 of 13, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just know from my prototype of 01, uh, when it was produced, the word 01 hadn't been officiated as an RPO, mm -hmm. and they're all, the bill sheets say King of the Hill. Mm -hmm. Even though when it finally went into production, they never recurred to it that much. When they were building the 50, that like the one I uh, had. Uh, my ZR1, it's an early 90 model, actually has KOH it does have on the spare. On the spare. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mine actually is written on the build sheet. Yeah. That, uh, uh, they had done. And I will do a thing on that. Uh, what's the most prestigious award this thing has won in this condition? Well, it's got the Bloomington Gold. It's got the uh, NCRS Top Flight. And they've asked me to go further with it, but I've got several Duntoff Awards. Uh, and uh, I've got other cars that I'm on. Yeah, you have other projects. <laughs> other projects. So this was an Amelia Island in? Oh, it won a. <laughs> Award at the Amelia Island. I was gonna say, hey, that's a pretty prestigious. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, old age, memory goes. Oh, uh, but, uh, that but, that was a hoot, also. Yeah, I imagine it was. Uh, anything else you'd like to say about the car? Well, we took it on the uh, California Melee in uh, 2002. Uh, Rich and Char Mason, good friends of ours took the Harley Earl SR2 and we took this 
and we did the California Mealy, which is only supposed to be a thousand miles, but it turned out to be about 1,250 miles. And uh, going away speakers was uh, Willie Brown and Mario Andretti. Mario furnished the wines for the week because he has a winery out there. And uh, all I can say about Willie Brown is he is a true car enthusiast and he wears more expensive suits than Mario does. Well, tell me about the, the impromptu car show that developed along that. That was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, the internet started getting hot, particularly when uh, we stayed one night at Mount Chasta and Harley Earl's niece was mayor of Mount Chasta at that time, and so Rich and Char got together with her and had dinner and talked quite a bit about her rich uncle and so on. <laughs> Since this was essentially uh, probably his idea that SR2 was. But uh, I know coming out of the Mount Chasta area towards uh, Sacramento, uh, the internet started getting hot. Uh, people would say, well, we, all, we saw these kit cars, it must have been a kit car convention coming down the road. Well, we had Ferraris that would sell for 10, 20, well, well in excess of 10, probably 20 million at this time on it. Uh, D-Jag number three, uh, Bob Bondurant was driving a noted racing Porsche of the 50s. Uh, the list just goes on and on about the important cars that were on this. And uh, that night we stayed in, uh, I want to say, either in the Napa Valley or Sonoma Valley, that was our last night. And it continued on. People were taking pictures of them outside the hotels. And uh, uh, you know, maybe these aren't kit cars. And I think that was the final conclusion that I bet some of the people that see this video say, oh yeah, that's it, I'll take pictures of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Post them up. <laughs> absolutely, maybe that guy that you talked about that saw one in Hawaii will come out oh. of woodwork and he said, yeah, I remember a red one. That was red in Hawaii then? Yeah, it okay. was uh, probably a Cadillac red okay. when it was in Hawaii. Which would confuse the heck out of everybody. Really. Yeah. When uh, this car was picked up at Dome, there was four of the SR1s there and the color combination was uh, red, white, blue, and Aztec copper. And the guy that was going to buy the car from uh, Grotewald, Dwayne Grotewald, wanted the red one. And uh, it was promised to somebody else. And uh, so he wound up with Aztec copper car, but then he painted all, almost immediately. One comical deal, Dwayne was talking about it, uh, these were farming communities, and the uh, locals were st starting to kid the owner of this car about, boy, you got a cheap one that didn't even have hubcaps on it. <laughs> Hubcap. Oh. But that guy, uh, according to Dwayne, bought two Corvettes a year. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know why the change or what have you, but uh, he, he sold a lot of Corvettes for a small farm in town. Since you know who the sell idea that sold it? Were you able to trace where the other cars went by name or anything like that? Not really. I mean, uh, Bill's the only one that uh, I've seen that really sh show up as documented. Okay. And uh, I have found almost no evidence. I really thought there was one car that had been cut up and uh, used for racing. Might have been, but I never did really find it high probability it was one, but I never, I tried to follow up, but you know, the guy just sold it or something like that, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I should have spent the time to try to document that one, but I didn't. This one is a fantastic car. All right, sir, I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you too. <laughs>